Okay. All right. So I'm going to be manning the uh, chat box, guys. So drop your questions in there. Say hey. <clears throat> Don't leave me lonely out there. So just, just keep an eye out for that. I'm going to be putting in some, some links. And um, we're going to be following up this meeting with an email with all the deets. So um, hopefully you'll get everything you need today. But yeah, you're going to see a lot of messages happening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, hold on. Somebody's kitty is crying. <laughs> All right. If we could have everybody mute themselves, that might help with the, the feedback that we're experiencing. Thank you, thank you, everybody. All right. Whenever you're ready, Mark and Christina, we can get started. Awesome. All right, Mark, uh, I, I can't see everyone anymore, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Mark is sharing his screen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for being here this morning to join us for our older adult transportation pop-up with uh, featuring the Gateway Cities. Um, we are excited to share some great information and also to host some uh, great uh, presenters and, and um, partners in the community. Um, I'll go ahead and ask and do some or do some house keeping real quick. Um, for interpretation, uh, we do have a Spanish interpretation for this presentation. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask if anybody does need it uh, to go ahead and click the interpretation box. Um, but before that, I will go ahead and say it in Spanish. Um, para, para cualquier participante que está acompañándonos hoy, si necesitan interpretación de esta pre presentación en español, a uh, favor de um, poner en el, en el chat box que necesita la interpre interpretación o si quiere nada más notificarnos um, activando su micrófono para dejarnos saber si necesitan interpre interpretación en español. Esperamos right, un ratito. I'm just asking if anybody does need Spanish interpretation to let us know in the chat box or to unmute themselves so that we can have that available. Okay, otra vez, si necesita interpretación, déjenos saber. Um, creo que no, no hay nadie. I don't think there's anybody that needs interpretation. So we'll go ahead and, and move forward um, with our housekeeping. Um, as you might have gotten the notification, this meeting will be recorded and we will go ahead and share it on our YouTube channel um, for ease um, and for those who are not here, we can share that with them. So um, we'll include that in the email uh, a little later on when we send you all the information. Please be sure to uh, mute your device, whether you're on the phone, on your tablet or on your computer. Um, and also, again, like Lily said, place any questions that you have on the chat box, um, and we'll be sure to monitor that and get to your questions as we go through today's presentation. All right, so before we get into the agenda overview, just very quickly wanted to ask two questions. You will have a, a screen pop up in front of you uh, asking the same question. The first one is, what region of the county are you from? So what region are you, of the county are you joining us from today? Is it San Gabriel, San Fernando Valley, the South Bay, maybe from Gateway Cities? Hopefully we have a few folks from there or Westside Central. So go ahead and click on one of those and submit your answer. I will click it myself. I am joining from the San Fernando Valley. Right, so again, you get a chance to, please go ahead and answer that question that popped up on your screen. What county are you joining us from? All right, and 
All right. Uh, so I'm see. from Lancaster and it's not listed. That's we 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 include that in San Fernando Valley, Fran. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So it looks like we have most folks joining us from San Gabriel Valley. We have San Fernando Valley close behind. Awesome. So we have folks from all over the county, which is great. So next question, um, and very important for us, uh, how did you hear about today's pop-up event? Again, the uh, screen will pop up on your, on your desktop or your tablet. Did you hear from us from Facebook, maybe from Instagram, maybe through an email or newsletter, or from word of mouth? Maybe somebody, your friend told you about it and you're joining us from there. So go ahead and answer that for us, please. How did you learn or hear about today's pop-up event? All right, we'll give it a couple more seconds. And let's see, email newsletter. All right, that's great for us to know when we reach out and, and plan future events. So thank you for sharing that with us. We'll go ahead and close that poll question. And let's get into what we'll, we'll be talking about today. So on today's agenda, of course, it would not be an on the move uh, meeting if we don't give a project overview or a overview of what our program is. Um, we will talk about some upcoming events and a few uh, programs that we have at Metro. Uh, we'll also hear from uh, West Santa Ana Branch Corridor Project, some updates on that project and what's going on there. We also have guests joining us from the Museum of La Latin Amer American Art. Um, oh, excuse me, Norwalk Transit. I, I got ahead of myself. Norwalk Transit representatives who will share with us some information about their services. And we will also hear from the Museum of Latin American Art uh, in Long Beach. So we have a great uh, discussion today about some of their exhibitions. And uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about trip planning, how to get to the Museum of Latin American Art using Metro. All right, so we have quite a, quite a busy agenda. So let's jump right into it. What is On The Move Writers Program? For those of you who might not be familiar, and this is your first On The Move event, our program seeks to enhance and improve senior mobility all throughout Los Angeles County. And we do so, do so through various ways. We host educational presentations at different centers, at different organizations. We provide transit-oriented resources for older adults. We host and participate in events throughout the county and um, we provide information or transit tours. And our key and signature part of our program is our On The Move Writers Club, which is our travel training uh, component of our program. Um, each club is led by volunteers who we like to call uh, travel buddies. And we actually have quite a few travel buddies joining us today. Thank you for being here. And essentially they plan and lead outings on transit for other people to uh, for other people in their community to kind of get around to different spaces throughout uh, Los Angeles County. Um, we do have a list of existing clubs on our website. You will see a link pop up shortly on the chat box. If you don't already have access to our website, go ahead and check out if there's a club near you in your area. Um, and next, I'd like to talk to you about how you can become a travel buddy. So as a travel buddy, we are essentially looking for individuals who have some experience riding transit, who like to help others and are willing to share their knowledge um, with a group or on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, for work as a travel, travel buddy, uh, volunteers who are 62 and older re receive a free easy transit pass. And this allows them to access Metro and other buses throughout the entire county. Um, if you would like more information about that and be involved and be a buddy, you could go ahead and contact Lily and she'll be more than happy to provide you with more information on how to become a buddy. Check out the chat box. There's a bit of information on how to contact her there. All right, so with that, I wanna share with you an, an, a video uh, to hear about from some of our current travel buddies about the program and the importance of using public transportation. As you get older, um, you might not drive anymore. How are you going to get someplace? You know, you have to learn how to do it. You can't just Uber or Lyft everywhere. Well, it got me out uh, to discover new things in, in Los Angeles because I'm not from here. And it was a way to get to know the city and the surrounding towns. 
And I learned a lot by doing that. Driving on the freeway is a totally different experience. It's so stressful. And that's one of the things I love about taking the bus. I don't have to do that work anymore. I just sit there and look out the window. I saying, actually, that's one of the reasons that I uh, got involved in the On the Move Friday program is because I am a, a firm believer in public transportation. Um, and I would try to impress upon them the idea that uh, the more people that can take public transportation cuts down on uh, traffic, cuts down on pollution. But in addition to that, it's just, I mean, it, it builds a sense of camaraderie, it builds a sense of community. All right, so we have some of our buddies that are actually here today that were also featured on that video. Um, so I hope that information was helpful. Again, reach out to Lily if you want more information on how to become a buddy. Um, I do also want to share that if you are not yet ready to become a buddy, you can still participate and be part of our clubs. Um, each, uh, each experience that you have, you'll, you'll get either through a one-on-one -on -one or as a group experience with our travel buddies and other participants. Um, you could travel with groups to fun des destinations. And overall, the goal um, is that after you participate and are part of more uh, trips, that you feel more confident to get out and ride on your own or maybe go out with a friend or a family member and show them how to use public transportation as well. So that's really our goal, really to empower you and, and have you be more confident when you're riding public transportation. Again, to find um, a club that's near you, you could check out our website, which is in the chat box. Um, I do wanna pause here and just ask if there's any questions about becoming a travel buddy or about participating um, with our uh, On The Move Writers Program. If you do, go ahead and put it on the chat box or maybe unmute yourself if you have a question. All right. I, I have a question. Oh, sure. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to know the easy pass if you're a travel buddy, is that when while you're doing the tour uh, or how long do you have the easy pass for? The easy pass is a monthly pass. And so dependent on whether if somebody uh, plans a trip, let's say in October, they would then receive their easy transit pass for the following month. So it sort of encourages people to continue to plan back to back uh, outings so that they can continue to have it all year if they plan one trip every month. Okay, great, thank you. Awesome, thank you for your question. Uh, any other questions? Either uh, you could go ahead and unmute yourself or type it in the chat box. If not, we will go ahead and keep moving forward. Just wanted to give a quick update on some um, news that we have here at Metro uh, briefly. Um, just to let you all know, bus fare collection is set to resume starting January of this upcoming year, so January 2020. Um, there will be discounted prices, so you do get six months of, of half price passes for all of our riders. Our one day, seven day and 30 day passes are half price um, starting again January 2022. So that would be a $3.50 day pass, $12.50 weekly pass and a $50 for a 30 day pass um, if you're not already enrolled in a discounted program. Again, um, these purchases are will be available starting December 15th until July 20th of 2022. So if you know anybody or um, uh, wanna take advantage of this, of, this, of these discounted prices, um, go ahead and, and do that as soon as you can. Um, I also wanted to share information about the low income fare is easy or otherwise known as the life program also comes with uh, six months of discounted fares for participants in that program. Um, life riders will get to ride for 90 days free of charge starting January 10th. Um, and that's again, remember that's when the fare collection resumes. So uh, to give you a breakdown, $26 for a 30 day pass, which is normally $76 when you're part of this program and $6.50 for a seven day pass, which is regularly $19.50. To sign up or to learn more about the LIFE program, um, you could visit metro.net slash writing slash LIFE. Again, we'll put that in the chat box for you to have and access. Um, and if there's not any questions on that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Lily who will share some 
upcoming events with us. Oh, right. So I, I have a, I'm sorry, Lily. Uh, go right I, ahead. Th I think someone asked about the senior pass for those of us yes. who don't qualify for the life pass. Yes, we will. So the same fares apply. So it's 35 cents or 75 cents for um, seniors for uh, single ride. Um, Gosh, it's been so long. I have to refer. Two fifty for day pass. Twenty dollar for for day for thirty day pass. So we'll make sure to um, follow up with the with the correct information um, in the email. Everyone, thank you for that. Okay, so I wanted to tell you about some upcoming events that we've got coming. Um, uh, on November 9th, we will be hosting a similar event to this one that you are attending today. Uh, but for the San Gabriel Valley, uh, our team has lined up some great presenters. If you're interested in learning more about um, the Gold Line Extension, you'll want to join us. Uh, if you'd also like to take a, a tour to the Huntington, is that correct, team? I believe it is the Huntington? Yes. Yes. And then um, I think emergency preparedness is also going to be there, correct? Right, right. Yes. So um, I put the link in the chat box. If you'd like to uh, RSV RSVP today, you can do that. And then one of our fun, 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 fun events, our Raised on Records concert, our virtual dance party, will be taking place uh, this December. Uh, dates to be uh, determined. Um, so just keep an eye out for your email because we'll be sending something out on that. Um, Muriel, did you have another question? I see your hand up. I did. <laughs> Excuse me. I did. Uh, regarding the San Gabriel Valley, will that include uh, some information or insights on Antelope Valley like Lancaster and Palmdale? San Gabriel, no, that would be the San oh, Fernando Valley. They're San part Fernando. of San Fernando. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. All right. So I want to encourage you all. I'm going to give you a link right now. And again, if you check out the um, chat box, if you'd like to stay up to date on upcoming events, sign up for our email list. For those of you who are not on our email list, there's a link in the chat box. It, it's very easy. It's only three questions. We basically just want to know who you are, where you're from, and what your email address is. And we will uh, make sure to send you uh, invitations to our upcoming <coughs> events. All right. I'm going to uh, pass it over to my colleague, uh, Mark Deerking. He's going to talk to us about the West Santa Ana branch. Mark, take it away. Hi. Thank you very much, Lily. Um, my name is Mark Deerking. I'm uh, with... Uh, uh, local government community relations, and uh, I've been working uh, with our project team on a new project that's rolling out. It's uh, it's not in construction yet. It's uh, an environmental document. For all of our major projects, we usually have to do some type of uh, planning and pre-engineering work and, and environmental uh, approval process, which involves reaching out to the public to get feedback. Um, we had a comment period that opened up uh, uh, over the last two months and just closed about a week or two ago. Um, and it's gonna be on the West Santa Ana Branch Transit Corridor Project, uh, which will primarily serve, uh, goes from downtown LA to Artesia. So it's gonna serve primarily the gateway cities, but also the downtown community. And, and of course, connecting uh, buses and, and trains from there. Next slide. I don't, there we go. Okay, so here's a here's a, a short video that'll uh, give you a, a better uh, understanding of the corridor and what's what's going on. So go ahead and roll the video. Metro is working on connecting Southeast LA communities to downtown LA with a new light rail transit line, and we want to update you on our progress. Southeast LA, also known as the Gateway Cities, is home to 1.4 million people and almost 620,000 jobs. These communities are currently not well connected to Metro's rail network, limiting travel options to mostly driving, which leads to more traffic and longer commutes. Metro has a plan to make it easier to get around, 
with dozens of projects to improve public transportation and create more access to opportunity. The West Santa Ana Branch Transit Corridor Project will provide a direct connection to the Metro A and C lines and better connect the area into Metro's network so more people can get where they need to go. Before we get into the latest updates on this project, let's briefly recap how we got here. Metro began studying the project with an initial alternatives analysis, which was completed in February 2013 and recommended light rail transit for this corridor. Between 2014 and 2018, we studied routing options for the northern section of this corridor through downtown LA. We gathered public input and refined our analysis. In May 2018, the Metro Board approved two potential northern alignments to move forward into the environmental review. The following year, the Board approved conducting analysis on initial operating segments to help deliver the project sooner. Environmental review is a formal, regulated process where Metro studies the performance and impact of a potential project before recommending a final project for the Metro Board of Directors to approve. Our environmental review process began in 2017. During this time, we heard from the community about routes and stations, security and safety, including having the rail line at a different level than the street, noise, vibration and construction impacts, and community and property impacts. From there, we refined our project definition, which the Metro Board approved in December 2018. Metro also worked with cities along the corridor to ensure the project supports local land use plans, creating a vision to support more vibrant communities and economic opportunity. That vision is outlined in the Transit-Oriented Development Strategic Implementation Plan, which was published in 2019. We are approaching an important milestone for the project by releasing our draft environmental impact statement and report, which evaluates the environmental benefits and effects of the project. The alternatives outlined in the document take into consideration all of the input that we've received along the way, as well as findings of technical studies on various parts of the project. Our draft environmental analyzes four route alternatives for the project. Based on what we heard from the community, these alternatives would be a mix of street level, aerial and underground alignments. The first two alternatives cover the full distance between downtown LA and Artesia, which is 19.3 miles. Alternative one would begin at Los Angeles Union Station and head south with a proposed station in the Arts District. A station connection in Little Tokyo is currently being studied as an optional station. From there it continues towards Huntington Park with proposed stations at Slauson Avenue near the Metro A-Line, then turns east with another proposed station at Pacific Randall. The route then turns south again with a proposed station at Florence Salt Lake in the city of Bell and another proposed station at Firestone in Southgate. Continuing south, this alternative also includes a proposed station at Gardendale in Downey and at the I-105 freeway and Metro C line in Southgate and Paramount. From there, the route turns east with a proposed station at Paramount Rosecrans in the city of Paramount. Then it continues to a proposed station to serve the city of Bellflower and ends with the proposed Pioneer Station in Artis. Alternative 2 begins at the existing 7th Street Metro Center Station in downtown LA and heads southeast with proposed connections to serve South Park and the Fashion District as well as the Arts District. From here, it heads south with all the same proposed stations as Alternative 1. Alternatives 3 and 4 are the initial operating segments approved in 2018 by the Metro Board to help deliver the project faster. Alternative 3 runs 14.8 miles, starting near the Metro A-Line Slauson Station. From here, it includes all of the same proposed stations as the other alternatives before ending in Artesia. Alternative 4 is a 6.6-mile segment. This alternative starts at the proposed I-105 C-Line Station, from here, it includes the same proposed stations as the other alternatives and has the same endpoint. We will be taking formal comments on the draft environmental at public hearings by mail, email, phone, and on our website during the official comment period. What happens next? 
In fall 2021, the Metro Board is anticipated to select one of the four alternatives as the locally preferred alternative. Our final route for this project to be cleared in the final environmental impact statement and report. Thanks for all your input along the way that has helped shape this project. We encourage you to provide comments during the official comment period and look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. That was a, a short overview. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, again, this is a um, 19 uh, mile corridor. Um, there's gonna be up to 12 stations depending on the final uh, uh, locally preferred alternative um, and up to new, five new park and ride facilities. The total study area that we're looking at is 998 square miles, uh, uh, population 1.4 million with uh, 618,000 in employment. Um, the population employment densities in this quarter are five times higher than other parts of LA County. Next slide. A little bit slow for me. There we are. So this is the timeline uh, that we've got on the project. Uh, as you can see, the project has started uh, as far back as 2013 with some initial uh, Metro and SCAG studies. Um, and then it moved forward. We went into our uh, initiate our draft EIS ER. We started in 2017. Um, and now we're doing a, a new update to incorporate uh, new alternatives. And we just released our environmental impact statement report this summer. Um, we're hoping to uh, have a uh, locally preferred alternative selected by the board in the early 2022, January is what we're looking at, um, with the final certification of the environmental document in 2022. Go ahead, next slide. The, uh, the draft EIS EIR project alternatives, there are four alternatives currently. There is an LA Union Station to Pioneer Station, which is uh, number one there and sort of the, uh, the orange hash line if you're looking at the document or the, the screen. The, uh, the second alternative is again 19.3 miles, but it makes a deviation. You can see there instead of going straight to Union Station, it, it, it heads off to um, um, the, uh, the seventh uh, and Metro Station in downtown LA uh, to hook up with the blue line there. Okay. And then um, the uh, alternative three, is a 14.8-mile uh, segment from Slauson to the A-Line. Alternative four is the C-Line to the Pioneer Station, 6.6 .6 miles. Next slide. Uh, we are looking at a number of uh, maintenance storage facilities. Maintenance storage facilities are where our trains go to sleep at night, um, and they go there to uh, also get repair and, and maintenance and, and, and uh, as needed on the project is also where the operators will pick up the, the train and take it out onto the route. Um, the, uh, we're looking at two sites possibly on this route. One of them is in Paramount. Um, and the second route that we're looking at is in Bellflower. Um, the Paramount one is uh, currently known as the uh, Paramount Swap Meet, Paramount drive -thin Theater. And uh, the 20 acres in Bellflower is a long-term city lease uh, currently being used by uh, such groups as Hollywood Sports Paintball and uh, Bellflower BMX. Next slide. The, um, the draft EIS EIR comment period um, is, uh, we started, as I mentioned, it went started on July 30th. Um, the period was extended 60 days. Uh, to date, we received uh, 415 official comments received uh, and over 428 uh, 20 participants at eight virtual forums. Uh, we also held tech booths at local locations where folks could come and if they didn't have a computer or didn't have access to Wi-Fi, we would assist them and help them if, if they didn't have those uh, digital resources available to them. Um, additional outreach during the common period, you can see there we had information booths, stakeholder briefings, and uh, notification campaigns of both mail and, and digital and door-to-door. Uh, -door. Next slide. Mark, can you tell us what EIS is and EIR is? Sure. Um, the EIS and EIR, as I mentioned at the beginning, were um, their uh, uh, studies. It's environmental clearances. It's a part of the um, um, uh, pre-engineering planning phase of this. It's a, it's a formally regulated process. Uh, for, uh, 
for folks to comment on the project and um, what we're looking at as a part of it. Next slide. So the uh, locally preferred alternative uh, is a um, uh, formal and official action by the Metro Board. Um, as you can see in the sort of the chart there, it takes a combination of public comments, technical feasibility, cost and funding, and that's where um, um, we, we define and come up with, with, an, uh, with a route that everybody agrees is what we're going to be moving forward with to build next and, and to be a part of the environmental document. Um, the, uh, the, uh, there's a cursor on the screen. Um, so the, the, the project will be analyzed um, and uh, decided upon by the Metro Board. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So the uh, staff preferred alternative at the moment, and this could change uh, based on what the board wishes to do, but we're looking at uh, uh, the alternative three. Alternative three is the Slauson A-Line, blue line to Pioneer. Um, it's been identified by sa staff to satisfy the public uh, disclosure requirements. We're required in the environmental document to, to say which route staff prefers. Um, and we have to come up with a purpose and need of why we need the project and what it's all about and we have to study the environmental impacts um, and benefits of the project and also look at cost and funding considerations um, again this is only a staff recommendation the metro board can modify change or select another alternative next slide the um, next steps uh, we are compiling the public comment for the metro board um, that'll be in the fall of 2021. Right now is what we're doing for that. Uh, again, we're looking at January, early 2022 as a part of the, uh, uh, the board to select a route that they want to build and construct. Um, and then once that's done, we will certify the final uh, environmental impact report. And um, then we are official. And, and we, once uh, funding is lined up, uh, we can start uh, early work on the, on the route and final engineering of the project. Next slide. So uh, these are ways to get involved in the project um, and stay involved. Uh, that's the, the address, the email address of, uh, or the mailing address of the um, um, project manager for this project. And we have a phone number where we're taking comments uh, uh, from the public. And we also have an email address, a website, um, of course, uh, all of your social media handles there with Facebook and Twitter as well, uh, so you can follow along with the project. So uh, that's the presentation, and I would welcome uh, questions and answers. Uh, how do you want to do this, Lily? Do you want to? We don't have any questions in the chat box, but does anybody have any questions? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask? We'd be happy to answer. When can I ride on this uh, project? <laughs> that will will any of us be alive? <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, that that takes pride. Uh, takes a lot of. Uh, it takes a number of years to get a, a transit corridor project going. So, uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out the total project funding and costs. But this is one of the projects that they would like to get done by twenty twenty eight. By twenty twenty eight, but it's still going to take a lot of time, uh, a lot of work to figure that out. Well, I'll, I'll try to hold on. They okay. say if you just if you just keep breathing, uh, you can live a long time. You can do it, Mike. You can do it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Feel free to unmute yourself. Drop it in the chat box. All right. I don't see anything or hear anything. Mark, thank you so much for sharing no this information. Thank you very with much us. for having me. Take care. Mark, we can see your little cursor when you're searching there. Um, go ahead, Christina. All right. So thank you again, Mark, for that information. Great, great info. Uh, now we will go ahead and move forward and hear from representatives from Norwalk Transit. We have um, Honesty Torres, who's a transit office assist assistant for Nor Norwalk Transit System, and also Teresa Clark, um, transit admin officer. Uh, Honesty and Teresa, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. 
Absolutely. Thank you so very much and good morning and happy Friday to the group. It's so nice to see so many lovely faces this morning. And as Christina mentioned, yes, my name is Teresa Clark. Just wanted to add that I've actually been with uh, the system for 15 years. And to my left is Honesty Torres, and she's actually worked for the city for 16 years. And so uh, basically just wanted to share with you that for those of you who may not be too familiar with the city of Norwalk, it's actually a bit of a sleepy community, a residential city uh, that you'd likely pass through without notice. But I wanted to mention that it's actually a very interesting city such that it is built like a quilt. You've got patches of new and patches of old. And prior to 1950, Norwalk was actually completely a dairy farming land. And uh, in addition to that, it was the producer of sweet sugar beets, the highest producer, I should mention, for the state of California. And given the old Victorian style architecture of the buildings within the city of Norwalk, the city has served as a backdrop for many Hollywood movies, uh, namely Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Man of Steel, The Karate Kid, Speed, and Grease 2. So with that, um, I'd like to hand it off to uh, Ms. Honesty Torres to give you more details about our services. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for that warm introduction. Um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide, Mark, please. <laughs> so our agency recently celebrated our 47th anniversary on August 1st. And within three short years, we're looking forward to celebrating our 50th. Um, <laughs> We currently offer six routes, three of which are constantly competing for first place with ridership, and those are routes one, four, and seven. We provide both local and interjurisdictional services where we connect you to several cities, uh, such as Almani, Cerritos, and unincorporated Los Angeles, just to name a few. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, uh, we do love our seniors here uh, mm -hmm. in the city of Norwalk, and we offer an outstanding Dalla Ride program to our local residents. Uh, this program uh, began at the same time as our fixed route. We offer both advanced reservation and taxi services. Uh, the program itself provides just under 20,000 trips a year to local locations uh, to popular places such as our senior center that provides uh, nutritional meals, uh, exercise programs, and dances. Um, those are some of the highlights at that location. Um, the fare itself is a dollar for one week trip and for our taxi, I'm sorry, that's for advanced reservation. And for our taxi program, it's a dollar copay um, with a balance of, or excuse me, the value of $16. Uh, next slide, Mark, please. Thank you. So the city of Norwalk is known as a connecting city. Uh, we like to highlight some of our service areas that we can connect you to or our systems, our other system is, excuse me. Um, those include the Almani bus station to the north, uh, the La Habra Orange County Green Line, the Norwalk Santa Fe Springs Metrolink, and the Metro Green Line station in Norwalk. Um, one that is not highlighted, which is our most popular route, is Route 1, and that will connect our local students uh, to Rio Hondo College. Uh, our ridership is just under 1.2 million, and our fleet consists of 33 vehicles, four of which we are proud to announce are our new four electric vehicles. Um, and we have roughly about 560 bus stops um, with our service area. Next slide, Mark, please. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if many of you are aware of this, but Norwalk is anchored by two rail heads, mm -hmm. um, one of which is at the Norwalk Santa Fe Springs Metrolink tra um, Transportation Center. The other is the Metro Green Line Station. There you can catch um, uh, connections between the Metro Local, Metro Express, and Long Beach. Uh, we'd also like to highlight the Almani bus station, where it is one of our most popular routes. You can go ahead and connect to a Greyhound there and travel uh, throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, next slide, please. And we'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us. 
Um, Teresa, would you like to add anything else to our? You know, uh, just with the thought that, um, you know, Norwalk really loves its seniors. I can't stress that enough. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'm a resident of Cerritos, which is a nearby city, and there simply is just no comparison. Uh, the program offerings and benefits are truly expansive. And if you're a senior resident for Norwalk, let me tell you, you will be spoiled. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. I have a question. Yes. What is the fare for fixed route? Do you have a senior rate? And what is the regular fare? Yes, that's a fantastic question, Lily. And I'm sorry I glanced over that. Um, so our regular fare for an adult is $1.25. Um, for children under the age of five, it is free. And for our senior disabled, it is 60 cents. Mm -hmm. We also accept the LIFE um, program, uh, as well as the Easy Pass and the TAP card. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Any questions out there? We've got some big thanks to all for this great presentation. Very informative from Tim. Anybody else have any questions or comments that they want to share? Janice. Oh, Janice has a question. Go right ahead, Janice. Yeah. I'm just wondering if I bring my seniors to Norwalk, do you have any suggestions for what we can do? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so the city does offer um, programming, let's say, for instance, uh, we have a fantastic 4th of July show. Um, we have free programs throughout the year. Our website does have update information um, that they can come and participate in. Um, I have to say right now due to COVID, it is very limited. Um, however, we are hoping, you know, with the new year coming that our programs will be expanded back to where they used to be. Um, but definitely we have um, the 4th of July is a highlight. We also have a snow fest event where we would have snow out in our lawn at City Hall um, and booths set up where the, we can come out. Um, we have summer concerts as well. Those are typically held um, in July and August. Um, and those are all free programs. You can just come sit and enjoy the music in the evening. Under the stars. Yes, right? under the yeah. stars, yes. Any, any cool um, museums that folks might find in Norwalk? Well, you know, I was gonna say, we have no, a Target Museum. We do, we yes. do have two mm -hmm. uh, museums throughout the city, but unfortunately right now due to yeah. COVID, they are closed. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I would just refer back to the city website. We can provide that information at a later time. Um, it, I believe it's norwalk.org um, where they'll update once those facilities are back open. And we do have docents for those as well. Mm -hmm. And they love to give guided tours. Do you have a suggestion for a nice day trip? A nice day trip. That's a very good question. It's a Any cool parks, question. public art, anything like that in your city? Um, most of our highlights are the two libraries that we do have. Um, we tend to have programming there. Um, and we can provide you with additional information if you like. Okay, that would be great if we could um, yes. uh, perhaps share that. Um, there, there is a a little India. I don't know if it's in Norwalk or in Cerritos. It's Artesia. Artesia. Okay. Yeah, they're very are there, close. Yeah. Are there <laughs> any um, other uh, you know interesting ethnic enclaves where people could you know have that sort of experience uh, um, that you're aware no, of? But if you're looking to get married, we. By all means, we do have the recorder's office down the way. So if anyone is looking to get hit. That's right. The big county offices are there. That's yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. Please come down and, and enjoy a trip and, you know. Let us know. We'll we'll stop by. <laughs> you know what? I did yeah. see lots of uh, public art. I want to remember, even when I went to the the county offices, there were lots of uh, uh, there was lots of public art that I remember. So yeah. that might be uh, something to check out. So um, we do have a program that the city puts on once a year. Um, it's an art program where we have closed down a portion of one of the streets. And we have vendors out there and street artwork. Um, but again, unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, it is cut back slightly. Um, so we can go ahead and, and share if they are um, expecting to have anything this coming year. That that would be really helpful. And then I can go ahead and share it with everybody. Yes, so yes, of course. Meryl, you have a question? Uh, yes, it's Marielle. Oh, Marielle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I wanted to know, uh, do you have any farmers markets on uh, uh, bus routes? And also, are there any senior services or senior centers that the uh, public transit services? Okay. Uh, we do have a farmers market. Thank you for asking. Um, it is on our Route 4 system. Um, there are other routes that you can connect to. It's on the corner of Imperial Highway and Norwalk mm -hmm. Boulevard. Uh, we offer it on Wednesdays, and we can provide um, Lily with more information on that. Um, and I'm sorry, what was your second question? The senior senior centers or senior services or community centers on the bus routes? Yes, we do provide the, uh, we do have a senior center and a social services center. Um, I believe those are, again, route one and three, I believe. Um, and we can provide um, contact information to Lily where she can um, share with the group. Lily, I had Thank a question you. about the County Hall of Records located <laughs> in Norwalk. Can they yeah. discuss that? It's very popular. What's your question? The County Hall of Records, can they discuss the scope of that office building and perhaps how to, how to get there? I went there one time to, to look for a death record on my family, but do they know the scope of that place as far as what what you can do there right like is it all encompassing the county hall of records i know it's in they have one in norwalk yes i think it is all encompassing i went there for like permits or something yes yeah do they so, have any additional yeah, information well mm -hmm. i don't know that they they would have it because they're with the transit agency i think that's mm -hmm. Pretty yeah, much, yeah, I think it's yeah. uh, pretty basic information that they would have, Irene. That's correct. I know it's hard to get there when you live in the valley. <laughs> yeah. If you but have to go there. I'm sure that it is serviced by public transit, correct, ladies? Yes, correct. Yeah. It's on a main, main, uh, main affair. Yeah. Uh, trip planning, Irene. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit, if that's something that you I remember to. going there, and it was not fun <laughs> you know, when I needed to look for a family uh, death record. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I would definitely call in advance just to see if they're taking yeah, uh, appointments yeah. or reservations. Mm -hmm. um, that way, you don't come down and you know, unfortunately waste your time. Yeah. You want to make sure that you're able to get the services that you need for the day of. Thank you. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, ladies, very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. So uh, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, we're very excited to have with us today uh, Soli Mar or Soli Salas from the uh, Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach. She is the Vice President of uh, Museum Content and Programming. So she has some great information and um, some exhibit information to share with us today. Um, and as it was also uh, mentioned in our outreach, we do have a uh, little giveaway from, from MOLA that we will go ahead and share towards the end of the presentation. Um, and to be eligible for that, you had to have signed up um, and registered through our Eventbrite and also be present uh, for uh, towards the end as well. So make sure to stick around. Um, Soli, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the invitation to share with you MOLA, the Museum of Latin American Art. We're located in Long Beach, California, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So we'll do a composite, a guided tour of MOLA. So we've been doing virtual tours for a while now since a, everybody shut down last year. And we wanted to share with you a little bit about what's going on in MOLA right now. Uh, thinking that it would be a great way to let you know what you can visit now that we're open to the public. Um, so first of all, if I can get a couple of thumbs up that everybody can see my screen. All right. Um, so like I mentioned, we're going to tour today virtually um, the exhibition Judy Vaca, Memorias de Nuestra Tierra, a retrospective of this artist who has been a, a landmark in the Southern California and general California area for a really long time. And that has made a really impactful um, a 
moment here in the in the arts uh, scene in California. Before we go into the exhibit, a little bit about the Museum of Latin American Art. We, our mission is to expand knowledge and appreciation of the modern contemporary Latin American and Latino art through the collection, groundbreaking exhibitions, stimulating educational programs and engaging cultural events. So you'll see that we have a lot going on, not just in the galleries, but a very robust calendar that we offer to the public. Um, a, thanks to a lot of uh, generous support from foundations as well as government and private, uh, private entities, we are able to offer a lot of this programming free of charge to, to our visitors. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try and be very aware of time. So if I'm going really fast, I need somebody to text me. Um, and I also want to mention, I'm joined today by Yareli Rojas. She's the coordinator of content and programs. Um, and she also works with me um, to make sure that we get all these tours out to the public as well. And we do the tours in English and in Spanish. We mainly do them in English, uh, but if there's a request, one of us will switch over to Spanish. I'm from Puerto Rico, so my accent will be a little different from everybody else's probably, but we still get ourselves understood, so not a problem. Um, so a little bit of information if you're interested in visiting, and I'm sure that the team at Metro will share a route of how to get to MOLA. Um, we're open to the public Wednesday through Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, we have our mission prices are ten dollars adults, seven for students and seniors, and free for children under twelve years old, and free for MOLA members too. And this is year-long MOLA member member a MOLA member benefit. Um, we also offer MOLA free Sundays. So this means that from eleven a.m. to five p.m. every Sunday, MOLA offers free admission to everybody. Um, and this is an effort. Um, from the museum to make it more accessible to everybody a, that may not have the economic means to pay admission fee because our mission is to get get as many people as possible to be exposed to art. We will be closed on Saturday, November 13th, so please be aware. Do not plan a field trip to MOLA on Saturday, November 13th. We are going to be setting up for our fundraising event that evening, which is the MOLA Gala. We do the one annually. And this year it will be an in-person event. So we're, we're taking care of all the COVID and security measures that that entails, as well as all the prep. And um, we will be honoring that evening with the Legado Awards. We'll be giving the award for um, artistic legacy to uh, the our Judy Baca, which is the artist that we'll see today. We'll also honor the LA Dodgers. And we, all, we were all talking about the LA Dodgers earlier today. Um, uh, for their community commitment uh, and all the community work that they've been doing. And we will also give the Lifetime Achievement Award um, for the legacy that Jaime Harin has, has shared with the public through his Spanish narrative of the Dodger games. So it's a busy November 13th. Don't come to MOLA November 13th. Come to MOLA November 14th, which is a free Sunday. Um, and we'll, we'll have the place ready for you when you come. So now on to the exhibition and I'll take questions at the end. If you also want to pop them into the comment section, feel free to do so. We'll try, I'll try to keep an eye out for those as well. Um, it may take me a while, but um, I'll make sure to try and keep up. We'll hey. go ahead and help you Soli with, with any questions that pop up in the chat, chat box. We'll, we'll oh. communicate them to you. Thank you. Okay. I, I like disembodied voices. They help me keep everything going. Thank you so much. Um, so a little bit about Judy Baca, Memorias de Nuestra Tierra, and that translates to Memories of Our Land. Um, this exhibition is the first comprehensive exhibition a retrospective of the artist's work. And a, she's internationally known as a Chicana muralist, um, educator as well, and, and social activist. Um, uh, she is a painter and a muralist um, and she's, and she's also been a pioneer in, 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 in public works and public artwork, as well as artivism, which is where art becomes a tool to talk about certain social issues that need to be um, highlighted. And she's, the, she's one of the founders of the Social and Public Arts Resource Center, SPARC, which is also um, open to the public. And it's in the Venice, uh, Venice uh, Beach area. So another place for you to visit. 
Uh, oh, okay. I see. I see in the chat, Mary. Um, so right now we do not offer that I know of lifetime memberships. Um, I can certainly ask my department, and if you let me know, you can send me a private message, and I'll I'll email you with more information about that possibility. Uh, I will also see to, in today's exhibition one example of what Judy Baca has done in terms of public art and also bringing awareness to the history of, of the Chicano and, and the LA and the Los Angeles residents and area. And that will be a look at the Great Wall of, of Los Angeles, which is located in, in the San Fernando Valley. It's a half mile long mural and it occupies the Tujunga Wash section of the LA River that's located in the San Fernando Valley. It's a public space. So you can also take public transportation to go visit that, that space. But for the museum, it was a very interesting um, challenge that we were able to bring some of the mural artwork to the exhibition when it's such a public artwork. So we'll see how we made that happen. As we move forward, we'll go into the one of the first and most um, impactful moments for the uh, for this exhibition, which is Judy Baca um, as the Pachuca. Um, and the first exhibition, the first gallery explores the, the womanist theme, the female themes that she explores as identity uh, within her artwork. And this is, uh, this is part of Las Tres Marias installation performance. And in this, she, she examines the Chicana identity. Um, La Pachuca, as a companion to the suit suitors in the 1940s and 50s, um, created a style and dress and makeup that served as a protection against a hostile environment. So we see how, how she portrays this. And let me see if I can do a bit of a close up. So these photos were derived from a series of photographs that Judy Baca um, took with Dona Dicic, who's the photographer. Mm -hmm. um, Judy Baca is the conceptual um, creator of this performance. Um, in 1975, for the first exclusively Chicana show in Los Angeles entitled Las Venas de la Mujer in the Women's Building of LA. Um, a Baca in, in here transformed herself into a Pachuca. So what we see is the artist assuming that identity of the Pachuca through projections on vanity table mirror. And that's where the photographs were taken. Right now, this, is a, this artwork has been added to the permanent collection at the Smithsonian Institution um, as part of the National Museum of American Arts a exhibition. So another, another, we see another example of this exploration of identity in this artwork that's called a, Las Tres Forever. And we see that it's, it's two images, one of the Pachuca, one of the Chola, which is the image that we have on the right of your screen. And in the center is a mirror where the visitor or the, or the individual that's looking at the, at the installation becomes part of this, of this narrative. So it's, it's, it's part of a, this performance piece that, a, that makes it, that makes you also examine your identity and how do you fit in into this larger narrative? So again, I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of time. A, so we're going to now, take another, uh, a deeper look into the social topics and social themes that um, Judy explores. And this one example of that is the Los Panchos Trinity and the Panchos that Judy uses and we'll see throughout the exhibition, um, which is taking the imagery of, of this resting Mexican, right? The sombrero, the pulled up knees, hugging the knees, um, which is so stereotypical, but then taking ownership and giving it new meaning. Um, where we look at narratives um, a, doing the examples of family, um, examples of migration, and then narratives of the religion that is so present in Latin American and Latino culture. So the, it's, it's just a, a, an empowering an image that has had so many negative connotations for so long and giving it new meaning. Um, so uh, so the, this trilogy in particular is an exhibition here at the museum. This next uh, presentation that I share with you is, um, it's a mural that was created uh, together with Carecen, um, which is uh, the Central Americans uh, from Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, um, an association that represents 
uh, this migrant community. The title for this piece is Cares and Migration of the Golden People. And when you, when you see it on, in the galleries, it's done in a golden substrate support. So it, it presents to you that sheen, that golden sheen, um, giving it a deeper meaning for the title. Um, this, uh, present, this, this artwork, it marks the period of major civil unrest and oppression in the 1970s and 80s, in which Central Americans were brutally forced to flee their homeland. So we see that exodus um, is part of the imagery. And just to make this a little bit, yes, there is a red helicopter in the back. Impressive that that's what popped up to you. Anybody else does, wants to put in the chat something that's, that, that they recognize from this uh, artwork? All right, so in, in sense of time, you can also input. Um, but one of the things that jumps out at me is Rigoberta Menchu. As one of those iconic figures, uh, right? And then the, the Arch Archbishop of El Salvador, right? Which is this image right here. Um, so this is how Judy Baca uh, takes that history and then incorporates and provides visual awareness of all these issues that Sorry, we need the to. Tree has, the tree has something. What does it yes. have? A snake. So that's, and, and those are cues and symbolisms from that indigenous community that is, is so much part of that migrant uh, force that has been that has been made to exile and leave. Um, so she integrates those, those uh, symbolisms as part of the narrative. But yes, and yet we see actually not one, but two red helicopters in the, in the top. Said gentleman in the glasses. So this is the Archbishop of El Salvador. Do that we know was, who, who those folks are in the volcano? Who in the volcano? Or who they, the mountain, who they represent? We have not asked the artist. So, but that will be a question to ask her. I, yes, and, and that's why I'm going really fast. And that's why I'm definitely inviting you to drop by Mola at some point. So it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, I'm trying to take a look at chats. A, yes, there is an address to the Great Wall of LA and I can share that at the end. Oh goodness, sorry, sped up. Trying to look at the chat. Um, the next artwork that I wanted to also share with you, um, which is something that has definitely been very impactful to K through 12 students, uh, which is really interesting, is the um, installation of raspados mojados which is this vendor cart that we have here. A, and, and it shows that symbolism of the working class that comes in and that has this, a, this vendor cart as one of their main, um, their main income generators. And here she utilizes a street vendor cart as a medium. Um, the work addresses the history of the US immigration policies tattooed on the backs of workers in the cities and fields. Um, this is an attempt uh, in Los Angeles to pass laws. Uh, well, the attempts in Los Angeles to pass laws to stop and severely restrict uh, push cart vendors from selling elotes, frutas, paletas, and raspados, um, making activists and non-aggressive mm -hmm. merchants who silently appropriate public spaces in largely Latino sections of our city. So this is just a narrative to bring awareness to that. And funny fact, I don't know if you know any Puerto Ricans, but if you do, if you mention to them piraguas, that's the same as a raspado. It's like snow cones. Um, again, I, I try to, I, it, for me, it's very interesting how I find parallelisms between where I come from and the Mexican a, culture and, and community here. It just, it reinforces the fact that there's so many shared experiences. And finally, we go into the Great Wall of LA and one of the one of the uh, images here that I'm sharing with you, it's a combination of, um, oh goodness, sorry. I think I'm just gonna stop looking at the chat right now. I'll there watch you know. it for you, Sully. Yeah, so I think I'll do that. Um, so the Great Wall of LA here, what we have is, is two images. On the left, 
you'll see the way we actually were able to bring the Wall of LA into the museum, which is using a 3D mapping effect, um, project around the walls in a 270 degree uh, experience, um, putting you inside the LA River and for you to be part of that, uh, that mural and that creation. So we have a space at the museum where you can sit and watch all the images from the Great Wall of LA. And the images that we have on the right in the slide are just samples of um, how each one of the decades are, or, or timestamps overlap within the larger, the larger narrative. The Great Wall of LA, as we'll see, and I'm, I just chose a few images so that we could have that as part of, of our, our lecture today. Um, the Great Wall of LA, it's a, it was built on, on this part of the LA River as a, as a work of, um, of community building on behalf of Judy Vaca. She was the, the conceptual creator and she worked with a group of, um, of students of youth at risk, um, collaborating artists as well. Um, that, that we're able to bring this idea together. It documents the LA area since prehistoric times all the way to the 1950s. Um, it is a half mile long mural, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, located in the Tujunga Wash flood control channel in the San Fernando Valley. Um, directed and initiated by Judy Vaca, it's a landmark of pictorial representation of the history of ethnic peoples of California from prehistoric times to the 1950s. It was begun in 1974. Um, and this year, this project received a, a National Endowment for the Arts, a 5 million grant to continue the documentation for the decades after 1950 to the present. So it's still, um, it's still a work of art that keeps developing and keeps growing. Um, it was, what we have right now was completed over five different summers. Um, it employed 400 youth from diverse social and economic backgrounds. And we see uh, an image in the upper left of our screens of all of, of a small sample of the youth that was working on this project. And, and it also included artists, oral historians, scholars, and multiple community members. So it becomes, it becomes a space for unity. And it also does represent a larger narrative, not just the Latino um, a perspective, but also from a lot of different a, a BIPOC community members. So as we move forward, um, just I, I kept this slide featuring the 19, the decade of 1940s, where she documents the Sud Sud riots. And we can tie this into the a, the identity seeking that she was doing when dressing up as a pachuca, when documenting the cholas, um, which are so tied into this era where the, when the Sud Sud riots happened in Los Angeles. Um, so again, presenting these narratives um, in a way that um, visuals can tell such a large story. Another section of the wall is a, the Chavez Ravin a narrative where the stadium comes to, to displace some of the members from that community. Um, later on, we see how, how efforts are being made to, to, to move forward from that, from that scene. So with that, we end the slideshow. And now I want to give you a little bit of a tour. Um, so that it's a little bit more dynamic. And you're okay on time, Soli. Um, okay. I'm, I know that folks will, if they have to leave, they will jump off. So feel okay. free to take your take your time. All right. Okay. Yeah, just again, I want to be sure. Um, so here we have the video that we create um, following an educational guideline that our team at MOLA develops. And this is an interactive way that we have of getting um, our online visitors uh, an experience to make them feel as if they were actually part of the exhibition. Um, here, and I'm going to stop for a minute. 
let's see if I can get. So this is a close up of that of the first artwork that we'll see when we come into the exhibition. And the title for this is actually the title of the exhibition, which is Memorias de Nuestra Tierra. Um, memories, the memory of our land. Eh? And this highlights specifically Colorado, um, where Judy Baca's mural, um, and this one in particular is located in Denver International Airport. Um, it's, it's very personal for the artist in particular. These are images of her grandparents as they were coming from Mexico to La Junta, Colorado, which is where they first arrived in the US. Um, and this happened during the Mexican Revolution. Uh, her grandparents followed the course uh, traveled by thousands of other Mexican families from Chihuahua to the United States um, through the historic Northern territories of Mexico. So Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, um, via the Ellis Island in quotes of the Southwest, El Paso. Uh, it is a story that has been little chronicled and one for which Baca was anxious to create a visual record. Um, over the years, through her work as a muralist, uh, Judy Baca has told many stories of the communities across the U.S., but never her own. So this is a moment for her to be part of that narrative and to document um, a historical opportunity. Um, La Memoria de Nuestra Tierra combines a beautifully hand-painted landscape and with historic photographs in a seamless blend imprinted upon the surface of metallic substrate. So she uses this particular um, support and with that metallic sheen to give it uh, more texture and, and a different narrative than what we see normally. And these are close-ups of some of the details from that narrative that we see the female figure, we, we see the male figure, and we see a child as well in this journey, in this path, um, as they walk through, the, through La Frontera. In this one in particular, as we go into the Womenist a Gallery, we see, we see how Baca immediately introduces us and we keep with this a personal narrative. And she introduces us to three generations, which is the title of this particular artwork. Here we see um, the grandmother figure, which is to the right with the traditional braids. And, and we also see a, her mother, a, her grandmother is called Francisca. And that's actually Judy's second name. So there, you see that tie-in generationally. Um, we see uh, her mother uh, in the center at the bottom. And we also see Judy as a child and also as a young adult. And, and it's a way for her to connect that matriarchal line in, in, her, in her personal story. So here we see some, some details of that, of that artwork. And we were discussing before when we were looking at this, a, a group of us, um, how the braids have meaning um, for, for a lot of um, our community members too, right? It ties us to, to, to a background, uh, a heritage that, that we proudly carry forward. And this is a close-up of Hortensia, which is Judy's mother. Um, and again, we see that strength that is so obvious in all, all, of, all of these three women. And I like to think this is Judy in her first communion, because we all had that kind of a get up. You know? I go into religion. Um, here, and this is a very interesting shot of one of the artworks uh, that we feature in this exhibition, which is an altar to Josefina. And with Day of the Dead so close by, um, we always start thinking of altars, right? And, and tributes. And this, is, and this is a way where Judy is paying tribute to this um, um, housekeeper. A, a persona that is, it's such a, a, an overall a opportunity that so many of our community members actually do. And just to treat that uh, with the honor and respect that it deserves, um, which is part of why this altar has been created. And we see several elements also within a, the, the female figure that a, we have here, which is 
um, in addition to all the articles that she uses for the cleaning purposes, we also see that virgin symbolism in her sweater. So carrying that with pride wherever she goes. And something really interesting to see here is the use of color, how she highlights the yellow gloves, how she highlights the red bucket um, that she carries. And these are examples that we start to see of those uh, panchos that we were talking about in the first slideshow, where she's using the outer part of the pancho to tell a story about migration, in this case, about the economy in the, in the first pancho that we saw. And she places these as part of this ultra installation that we'll see in this first gallery. Now we're moving forward with um, other representations of her mural work. And this is another way that we apply and use uh, the space to bring in murals that we can't physically take out of the building and put them at MOLA, but we can show you the process as well of how a mural gets made. So we'll go from the black and white sketch and the annotations of the artist, what goes here, why does this go here? And we see all of these side comments on the border, the margin. Um, and then we'll see the colorization process, which is how this black and white a version of the mural becomes, or we start seeing how it gets the color assigned. It's fascinating to see all the details and also the thought process behind the the, the justification or the choosing of certain elements that we'll see in these uh, black and white sketches. Here we have, again, we continue with this storyline of um, art as a social awareness tool. Um, th these are the arch of dignity, equality, and justice. Um, and these are paying tribute to Cesar Chavez. We also have images of uh, Dolores Huerta and Gandhi as, as different ways of, of protesting an issue and, and a questioning that we have. Um, we quickly go into the Raspados Mojados installation that we talked about a little bit before. And this is a wide shot of the exhibition. We see again, the repeated motif of the panchos again, and that's a, that's a, and taking ownership of that image, right? Not, not giving it what has been stereotypically um, assigned to that figure um, as lazy or, or sleeping, but it's actually integrated into this working um, active um, economy generator, which is the food cart that we see. So here's, I'm gonna pause the video right here so we can have uh, a, more of a comfortable picture of the installation. And this is on loan from the San Jose Museum of Art. And again, it's just, it's, it's interesting to see how she's using um, these elements as well. So these are the panchos that we saw in the, in the presentation um, at the beginning. And uh, the arrangement is very purposeful to show you how these three narratives and this trilogy of panchos work together in terms of the elements and the topics that they, they all explore. In the background of the gallery shots, you also see um, other topics that we present. So the world wall was a big project that she has, and she will be setting that up a, as part of an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art next summer. So, Judy is, has a very active year coming on, and these are all the destinations that you can definitely take public transportation to. Probably Mocha will be closer than Long Beach, but please do come to Long Beach. So let's see. Yeah. So I'm going to, let's see, I'm, I'm forwarding it a little bit because we're, we're close to the 1125 mark. And this is the Caresen mural that we were talking about. And this is how it looks in the galleries. Um, even with the yellow background in the wall, when you're up close to it, you see that golden shine that the metallic uh, surface of the support has um, when, looking at the, when looking at these uh, 
at these artworks and the, in particular this reproduction that was done specifically for this exhibition. And this mural exists as well in the Carecen building that's located in, in Los Angeles. But I'm not sure if it's public access or you actually need to make an appointment. And this is the last image that we'll see in this uh, virtual tour. And we're actually very happy to inform that this uh, image in particular uh, has been incorporated into the, the Museum of Latin American Arts collection which is one of the most recent murals that Julie Baca has completed. Um, it's been an ongoing process. Uh, this mural started in, in the 1980s and it was completed this year specifically for the exhibition. It's a double-sided mural. So I'm gonna stop right here in this close-up and talk a little bit about a, this side of the mural, which is the one that we're seeing. And this one is called The Birth of the Vision of the Heart. Um, in, uh, for both murals, uh, Judy Baca um, uh, was contemplating or had in mind Merlin Stone's When God Was a Woman, a, an exploration of ancient worship of the female goddess and the subsequent suppression of women's rights. Developed a, and she developed a workshop process a, to source ideas, record dreams and construct imagery than content emblematic of females. Um, so the double-sided triptych, a 13 women in the volcanic eruption, that's one side we're not seeing today. And the birth of the vision of the heart, which is what we see, was brought to completion in 2021. Um, so as Baca was developing and advancing on these paradigms. I'll talk a little bit um, just of the birth of the vision of the heart. And it is a continuation of, of this greater story and a, the great ceremony of a ritual, a goddess possessing vital energy, Mother Earth. She stands with her hands extending into larger flowering branches. So I'm gonna let the video run a little bit more. So we see that her rhizomatic feet extending into deep roots and through her body, blood spreads in venous threads that connect her corporeal mass to an earthly paradise and the originally source of life, the originating source of life, a fertile pond in the most ancient forms of life. So we see how Judy Baca brings all this imagery into this visual narrative of, of, of female mother earth and, and how she integrates that into, into different sources. We see the imagery of the corn, the wheat as part of her headdress, uh, which is nourishment. And we see the tree as, an, a, as a narrative to the tree of life, right? Just throwing down roots, extending, being um, all encompassing. Uh, so, and for us, it's, a, it's definitely very, very important to keep documenting these artists into our collection um, as we keep growing as a museum and making sure that all of these uh, representations are, are obvious and available to the public. With this, I'm, I'm concluding my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it and I really thank all the supporters for the exhibition. This could not, it takes a village and it could not have done, been done without them. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And if there are any questions in the chat that I didn't see or anybody wants to ask anything, I guess. There's lots of thank yous. Um, really appreciative of the presentation which shows a lot of the life line of us as American slash Mexicans. Thank you, Ms. Salas. There's lots of wows, powerful visuals. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for a meaningful presentation. So uh, you've definitely uh, impacted some folks here in our audience and we really do appreciate that. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Want to unmute yourself? May Sue, you have a question or is that, are you clapping? I have a question. Go right ahead, Gretchen. Uh, yes, do you have other uh, Latin American artists on view now, like part of your permanent collection in addition? Yes, yes we do. So right now we, we have another exhibition by the title Gabriela Sanchez, Partial Pictures. She's not part of the collection, but she's, she's a young up and coming Chicana artist. And we have, it's a, a selection of about 14 of her artworks. We are currently installing the second 
installment of the exhibition Herland, which is based completely in the MOLA collection. And we are going to be presenting the topics boundaries and fear within a, the MOLA collection. And the title is Herland, Women Artists in the MOLA Collection. So it'll be about, I would say, 20 artworks from the collection made by women, Latin American women, a Latinx women, Latina women. A, and that will be on exhibition probably in the next couple of weeks because we're just finishing up install. So we are just waiting for, for the, uh, the, the education text to go up on the wall. So maybe give it a couple of weeks, but yes. And then we'll be back to having a full, a full set of it, galleries available. Thank you. Any other questions, Marielle? Sorry, Mara, I did see yes, one um, question. Okay, so go ahead. I, I did see okay. one question on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the question is from Richard. Are there any MOLA art pieces anywhere on the Metro Rail? So I don't think, I, I, to my knowledge, I don't think, I think the answer is no, but I'll let Lily and Mark help me out because I just got to MOLA 2018. So I don't know if there's anything before then. Uh, I, we would have to ask, we, we, we wouldn't know that information, but... Uh... Good question. Yeah. Rich, I would I would say there's probably some Metro artists that are featured at stations that have also been featured at MOLA, maybe part of their permanent collection or, or in the past, but I'm sure there's some artists that have worked on both Metro projects and have also been featured at MOLA. Wonderful. Marielle, did you have a question, Marielle? Yes, thank you. I wanted to know if the museum uh, has an artist in residence or an artist in training um, that's uh, supporting the development of young uh, artists or up and coming artists? So we currently do not have that program um, in place. Thank you for the question. We do have occasionally, and this is all subject to funding availability, um, have created a artist residency programs. And then we do, what we do have is a very robust internship program. And usually when we have a resident, a resident, no, a artist in residence. Um, we source directly from these a uh, fine arts programs in the universities. We have Cal State Long Beach really close by. We've worked with UCLA students as well, um, and we've done with UC Irvine students. So um, we were very aware to through our internship program provide mentoring either within the museum studies field or within the arts field um, whenever the opportunities arise. But we do not have an artist in residence. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. I was I was thinking of East LA, so thank you. Ah, okay. All right. I don't see any other questions in the chat box and no hands up. So thank you very much, Soli. It was uh, wonderful to have you. And I hope that this is just a taste for everybody, right? Like now you've, you've got a little taste. Now, once you're ready to get out there and ride, you'll head out to uh, Long Beach and check out the museum for yourself. Wait, is there a Metro stop near the, the museum? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked because we just set up our next uh, <laughs> slide. Take it away. Thank you so much, Solimar and Yareli. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to quickly go through our trip planning portion of this. Um, let me just go ahead. All right. So um, now that we've learned about this incredible museum, uh, we're going to find out um, how to get there using LA Metro. So this demonstration is using Google Maps. You can also go on metro.net, or if you have the transit app on your smartphone, you could use that as well. And you might see a similar um, trip. So I just chose the Compton Courthouse as our uh, starting location. Um, just, you know, I wanted to choose an area close by. Um, so first I put in my starting point and then I just typed in MOLA. Um, once I click search, I was given two transit options. As you can see, the one at the top asked me to take the Metro A or Blue Line and take another bus. Whereas the option below asked me to take the Metro A line and then walk. 
So I chose the option, which is take the Metro A line and then walk. Then I selected that option to see more details. And it brought me to this next page. Um, when I read through the directions, it does say to take the Metro A line towards downtown Long Beach headed south. Then it also tells me that I exit at Fifth, Fifth Street Station and walk about 11 miles, I'm sorry, 11 minutes or <laughs> point, 11 minutes or 0.5 miles. That's half a mile. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah half that, a mile. That is, mm -hmm. that is half a mile. Not too um, bad. So this is the trip. You would take the Metro A line. And then from there, you would just walk uh, a half a mile to get to Mola. Um, a reminder to always think about your trip back. So half a mile there, half a mile back is a, a mile of walking when you do your trip planning. All right, so it's easy as that. Um, we hope one day you can do a trip over there with um, your travel group as well. Um, another artwork that was featured was the Great Wall of Los Angeles. And when I first looked at the location, I said, oh, it's about a mile from um, the Orange Line, Los Angeles Valley College Station. So you would take the subway to North Hollywood Station, take the Orange Line to Los Angeles Valley College Station and then walk. But I didn't do my trip planning yet. So when I was able to add the address and do my trip planning, and as everyone can see, I think Lily put in the chat box, the address of the Great Wall of Los Angeles by uh, Judy Baca and all those artists is there. But when I did the trip planning, um, I saw that there was a much easier way to get there from North Hollywood Station. You would just take the subway and there's actually a bus, the 154, and that'll take you directly to the intersection where um, the mural is located. So, you know, originally I looked at the map, but upon further inspection, when I did trip planning, you found out that you can save a lot of time and a lot of energy um, just taking a bus directly from the North Hollywood station. Yes, the importance of trip planning. It's right. so important. Great. Uh, How did you get that uh, animation? How did you get those? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I built it into the presentation. Uh, oh, the, yeah. I want one of those. <laughs> Yeah, Mark's pretty, pretty handy at that kind of stuff. But um, I think both of these destinations are definitely places that uh, are very accessible and easy to check out. I'm really interested in that wall of LA. I, I'm just learning about this, you know, I'm from the opposite end of LA. And we have lots of murals uh, where I grew up in East LA. And I'm very familiar with that. But I'm, I'm very interested to check out the, the Great Wall of LA in North Hollywood and see what that's like. Has anyone been there or seen it? Mm -mm. No. Oh, you have Christina. Oh, and Salimar. Yes. Okay, cool. Have you walked? Did you walk the whole thing, Christina? I haven't walked the whole thing, uh, but I have seen sections of it. Um, it's very visible and, and uh, when you're either driving or just passing through there. It's really nice. Soli, you've been through, you've walked the whole thing or part of it? Yeah. So um, our team here at MOLA, we decided we need to see what we have on exhibition. So we made the trek up to the Great Wall. Definitely remember to bring um, sun protection, a hat. Um, there's a lot of trees, but it's, it's, it gets hot. And uh, there's not that many places to buy water or refreshments. So at least remember to take water. It's a nice place to do a picnic. So if you want to take a sandwich or something, that's, that's also a good place to spend a little time. Um, but yeah, so you, you do the whole walk and there's actually um, some planned a, a improvements to the area as well. So walking a bridges that go over the, the river, that will come in uh, later on, but I think it definitely will be an experience to enjoy. And it's an easy walk. Nice, good to know. Um, any other questions out there about trip planning? I put the information in the chat box. Mark mentioned going online, but you can always call Metro and get information via the telephone if you're not comfortable um, using those virtual or online tools. All right, next, Mark. All right, for those of you who stayed the extra 10 or so minutes, um, there's a prize involved. Uh, thanks to 
Mola. Um, they've decided to host a raffle for, for us where one lucky winner will get an individual membership for Mola for an entire year. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my new screen. Um, let me see this. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and do this. And do full screen. Is everybody able to see the full screen? We see YouTube. Oh, what now about? we see Google. Okay, now. Okay, great. So I'm going to click to spin. Uh, <laughs> if one of you sees your name pop up, please unmute yourself or write in the chat box that you are present and you are available to take the, um, the prize. So let's go ahead and get started. Big money, big money. <laughs> It's uh, hilarious yeah. how you create these things. <laughs> is Brian, Brian, Brian. Monica, Monica Huffnagel, are you here? Are you are you here with us? Let me search and see if she's in. Nope, she's not here. Right. Well, what? We got to spin again. Just keep going, keep going. <laughs> I think I took my name out. I'm not sure. I love the sound effects. <laughs> Yeah. Lawrence right 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 Harsha, are you here today? Nope, Lawrence isn't here. I searched the participants. Oh Lord, come on, big money. We're, we're here. We're here. Hi, Lawrence Harsha. Oh, oh, Lawrence is here. Stop, stop. Lawrence is here. All right, Lawrence. Lawrence. All right, Lawrence, can you please contact uh, me, Lily? And then that leads to. Um, okay, how do we contact you, Lily? Let me give you my phone number, okay? Are you okay. ready? Yes. 213 922 2299. That's 213 922. Two two nine nine. You got it. Okay, I'll call you in a little bit then. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you for playing, everyone, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Everybody have a great day. God bless you all. Dude, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye everybody. And thank Hi. you Wonderful very much. Day. Great presentation. Thank you, Salima. Thank you. Very thank nice. You. Thank everybody. you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, Lily. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Love your program. Oh, love you. <laughs> yeah, I'll call right now. Right? Yes, please. <clears throat> Beautiful.